clear. One of the things that I like to, to, to capture for people, and uh, we did some of this in our phone conversation, is just how somebody comes to be in this field and to be to bring the kind of passion that it takes to get anywhere in this field. Like, who are mm-hmm. you and why are you here? Okay. So a few minutes on that. No, I can I can begin at the beginning of that then. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that's uh, basically the story of my first decade decades long collaborator Richard West and we were cognitive psychologists and uh, at University of Michigan together as graduate students and um, he was in the developmental area and I was in the cognitive area and um, we were interested this was early 70s just to set the scene and uh, um, the information processing Revolution was rolling over psychology and, and um, cognitive psychology, and we were uh, we were uh, right in the middle of that. And then we basically just the both of us wanted to work on something that could make a difference to um, to the real world. And um, yeah, we we kind of found each other uh, as uh, as uh, graduate students and um, began the collaboration. Um, then, which now has, has marked its uh, third decade just recently. Uh, and as I think I mentioned to you in the, in the phone interview, um, the, uh, we were um, kind of inspired um, by one of the books on the psychology of reading that had a big impact in the early 70s. And that was Frank Smith's book, Understanding Reading. And um, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure now whether to continue the biographical part or to talk more about what we actually did, because my, my career is kind of bound up with, with two collaborators. Richard West is one. And then the other is Ann Cunningham. And, and that's a 25-year-plus uh, collaboration. And I met Ann slightly differently in my first year as an assistant professor. Uh, she um, was a uh, she was teaching, and she wanted to come back to school to do graduate work in uh, in um, developmental psychology, and um, but to do the graduate work she needed uh, some prerequisite statistics and research methodology, and so it was the the first statistics courses that I taught as an assistant professor. She walked in the door and was memorable because she walked in late. Uh, because she was teaching, and it was a a late afternoon course. And uh, she uh, uh, had contacted me and apologized that she couldn't actually make the start time. So I had coded her earlier as this teacher who came into my class late every day. And um, then um, um, we, um, uh, she collaborated with me on on some, uh, um, research projects and and um, during her graduate career won the IRA dissertation of the year award and and kind of the rest is history but uh, we we continued then her and I continued a 25 year collaboration um, and so that's uh, and and you know you ask where does the passion come from it comes from from collaborators <laughs> it comes from from people to talk to who who also really care, <laughs> um, and then uh, those the collaborations with Rich and Anne reflect two kind of content areas that I've been involved in in the study of reading that we talked about briefly on the phone, and the one with Rich concerned the way context operates in reading and what exactly the role of the word recognition process is uh, in reading. And then with Anne um, was the work establishing um, now something we all take for granted, the importance of phonological processes. Um, but two, two and a half decades ago was, was something that was kind of, you know, in doubt. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that prehistory is worth talking about. Sure, how um, you come to frame the challenge. How, how it was framed, because I think... The framework, uh, as, as I said to you, I read a few of the interviews last night, uh, and uh, uh, the framework you're working from is, I think, I mean, l- 
largely uh, very convergent with what you would call the research consensus in the field uh, um, uh, today with, with, uh, with, with, with two, with, yeah, well, with some caveats, tiny caveats <laughs> uh, that we can get to at the end. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, but, but you've, you've got 90 at least percent overlap. And, and so maybe if I talk about a little bit about this history, though, it, it will contextualize that because, because I begin in the prehistory of the field. <laughs> now, now, this is not to slight uh, um, previous workers, okay? But, but the point is, like any scientific endeavor, there are critical mass issues. There are issues of when a paradigm is developed, where you have methods, where you have theories, and where you have a critical mass of investigators exchanging um, the information, where things really take off. That's what I'm talking about with respect to the prehistory. You go back to 1970, there was no such thing. It doesn't mean that there weren't you know, brave, courageous <laughs> precursors. I mean, Gene Chawl did a, a paper on what we would now call phonemic awareness in 1963, Bob Calfey, Dick Dick Fineski, um, uh, sadly passed away, but Dick and and Don Macero and Calfey, uh, you know, some uh, early work on these issues in the '60s, but there just wasn't the critical mass of cognitive psychologists, developmental psychologists, neuropsych people, all in the convergence of disciplines that it takes to take to make a sea change in the way we think as a group that's exactly right and and that's what wasn't there in uh the early 70s and um so um there were these um relatively vague theories about <laughs> reading and and how it worked and we were excited about this the smith book first edition of understanding reading came out in 1971 the reason we were excited as young cognitive psychologists is that it it was it, it was kind of synthesizing all of the basic research that um, embodied the cognitive revolution. So Shannon's information theory, uh, Nicer's famous textbook in the early '60s, stage models, box all the, the early boxology models of. Uh, processing feature analysis, redundancy, the, the, the importance of redundancy in, in, in pattern recognition. And, and what Smith did was, was kind of synthesize all these ideas into um, a model of reading, which, which later on we became one of the classic, what are known as the top-down models, uh, models of reading. And, and so the irony in this early collaboration with West is that we were inspired by the Smith book wanted to do some empirical research on the issues. One of the, one of the things we noticed, it was an incredibly creative synthesis. But um, the book itself was top down in the sense that, that it was kind of picking and choosing from theory. There wasn't hard data directly on the processing issues in question, the type of thing an information processing psychologist, what we would have called ourselves at the time, uh, would, would take as the coin of the realm. And, and so uh, we thought, well, you know, two young investigators, right, we'll make our, we'll get started by providing some of this empirical evidence. Uh, the bottom line I'm getting to is that we kind of thought that Smith's conception was right. And Smith's conception, along with Ken Goodman's early work, ironically, uh, was the psycholinguistic guessing game view of reading, uh, the view that we guess our way through the text using all this top-down information, minimally sampling visual features, minimally recoding to phonology. Um, it was it was one of those cases where it was it, that was too beautiful not to be true. It was it was so it was so so theoretically neat in the way it fit in with uh, cognitive psychology. It was full of that stuff. All right, you know redundancy. How we, uh, how you know, it, you you cut a you cut a bit of speech out of context, and you can't recognize it, but then you put it in uh, the real context, and all, and all of these top-down influences. So the irony is, the very first um, study we conducted, uh, we were interested in individual differences. That was going to be one of our one of our least. We were interested in developmental issues. Um, what the stages of development are, individual differences, why people, some people progress faster in reading than others. Uh, and so we 
thought we'd provide some hard evidence for a very basic prediction that um, um, that Smith made, and that is if if the way to good reading is psycholinguistic guessing, then that must be what the betters are doing. Better readers are doing more of, and so we just thought we would we would uh, set up a, a a little paradigm of context effects, and then I, I won't get into too many details here, but we we kind of borrowed some paradigms from information processing psychology on you know what what we would now call priming sentence priming and and you know measured with reaction time techniques in an online processing how much contextual facilitation um, a person received on there and of course this is the key on their word recognition we focused on the word recognition process it was the thing that was most tractable for an information processing psychologist um, and we ran some children we ran some adults we measured their we had variation in reading ability and uh, lo and behold very first study we were still graduate students the poorer readers were using context more <laughs> it was exactly the opposite it's exactly the opposite of what the Smith theoretical view um, had said. And in fact, then in a whole series of studies on context effects, um, that's what we continually found. Whether you looked at it developmentally, whether you looked at it as individual differences within an age level, the, the individual difference correlation went in exactly the opposite direction. One of the keys... Uh, to, to why that finding occurred is that that we had focused on context effects at the word recognition level, okay, um, and um, that has an interesting coda, an important lesson for people studying the reading process. Uh, in, <clears throat> introspection can be very unreliable with a process like reading, where we have, and as you've I see in the interviews and yourself, David, written um, and, and spoken eloquently about the, the, the rapid online integration of these processes. Well, that things are going on so fast, it's very hard really to introspect. This is one of the ways that Smith went wrong. People have the feeling that, that you know, context is incredibly involved in what they're doing in reading, and they're right, uh, but most of those context effects for a good reader at the level of comprehension, okay? They're, they're not context effects that are priming ongoing word recognition. Except insofar as comprehension is facilitating word recognition in its loop. Yes, that's true. But in a good reader, often the wor lots of word recognition processes are pretty autonomous. Okay. Now, yeah, there are effects like amb amb ambiguity effects that have been that have been certainly certainly studied uh, um, in in But many of those those effects are what uh, an experimental psychologist would call post lexical. Okay. They're they're after the the orthographic and phonological information has actually accessed the lexicon, okay? And then when, you know, when, uh, when issues of ambiguity come up post-access, so is it bank, bank, is it, is it financial bank, is it river bank, then all those effects kick in. Which, which can, can take having to buffer the whole sentence or a larger unit in order to disambiguate what a word actually is yeah, and contextually so as to be able to figure out what its pronunciation is. And there's all, there's all kinds of work on that. But what, what we were focusing on in these early studies were Smith's idea that, uh, that the actual visual feature pickup, the actual phonological recoding was lightened because of these redundancy effects, okay? And, and at that level, um, those effects simply weren't there, okay? In fact, if you use context for a lot of that, you're, you're draining capacity from comprehension. You're looping too far out. Exactly. Okay, and and that's when then I, I summarize some of this work in, in a, um, uh, a, a, a 1980 paper that uh, where, that was called the interactive compensatory model, where where again a lot of the framework that I know you're working from is consistent with some of the things in that model. We 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 lighten uh, the load of processing. At, at inferential levels by, by having the lower levels uh, uh, automatized, okay? Um, High-level comprehension takes um, 
processes that are very capacity draining. Right. We have to we if 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 you're deeply into a text, you're building alternative models of the world. Okay. And and it takes a, a, a very computationally demanding process. Cognitive scientists sometimes call it decoupling, okay, where 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 you decouple from from your primary representation of the world. So you have perceptual representations of the field around you. That would be a primary representation. Uh, but but in order to run an alternative world to build a text model, okay, you you have to decouple representations from the world. Uh, it's a very cognitively demanding. Um, uh, process. Cognitive scientists have all kinds of fancy techniques for measuring. call it metalinguistic freedom or distance to Free, be yourself to that's be reflective. Right. F exactly. Freeing yourself from that world tracking, which is why, by the way, when, we, when you see people thinking, they look at the ceiling, we close our eyes, we, we, we wonder, we don't focus on the person we're talking with. Okay, why? You're trying to shut down that primary representation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why is decoupling uh, sometimes uh, aversive and difficult? Okay, there's probably an evolutionary story to be told there. A fellow by the name of Art Glenberg at Wisconsin has speculated about this that that uh, that you know uh, decoupling from the from primary representation shouldn't be done lightly. You may you may get eaten. <laughs> That's why some other system has to come in and create some priorities about how you're coupling and decoupling. Right. So so anyway, we're. <clears throat> Uh, sliding off the topic, but the point I, 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 ra I raise that to emphasize some of the reasons why these processes are computationally expensive, that you have to go offline. Uh, and, and in order to get off, offline, the online things have to be going with great efficiency. Okay. And that was the interactive compensatory insight from, from 1980, which, um, which then uh, was part of a big controversy in reading uh, on this, the so-called bottom-up and top-down kind of models of reading and, and the eventual synthesis of that in knowing, well, exactly where does top-down processing operate and exactly where does the, our, <clears throat> do we see the importance of kind of automatic um, word recognition. Uh, so that was the um, um, the line of work uh, on reading with uh, with uh, West, um, and then that work uh, and um, the work with Ann Cunningham uh, on uh, w uh, some of the early um, phonological awareness work. Um, and I, I describe our work on that in, in the early 80s as the third wave. Uh, and again, using this model of scientific communities that you, you mentioned earlier, the, the early wave were the, were the smattering of studies in the early 60s. Gene Chawl had a, had a study in The Reading Teacher in 1963, uh, a fellow by the name of Bruce in Britain. Um, Calfee uh, had a couple of studies, but but... But they didn't, there was no kindling, there was no fire from that work. Uh, really the work that set uh, off um, the, uh, uh, the field was uh, uh, the Isabel Lieberman um, uh, study in JECP in 1974 uh, with, the tap, with the phoneme tapping task. And uh, that work then set a bunch of us scurrying off. Okay, and, uh, and, and, and so, uh, uh, that was the match, and and we were kind of in the third wave, <laughs> the 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 people that went scurrying off, uh, saying that. So the there's... phoneme tapping really nailed the correspondence between the uh, phonemic processing activities and reading performance at the bottoms up level that drew you into this. Yes, yes, that's right, and and embedded it within uh, some of the theoretical um, uh, models of speech perception of of L. Um, Lieberman and some of those some of those issues of co-articulation, why the phoneme level might be difficult, um, and the types of things that you've you've talked about with uh, Cunningham and Reed Lyon and uh, and others, and uh, um, and so there were these there were these kind of lines coming together uh, in uh, the 1980s um, that. Um, um, that I synthesized in um, in the 
um, the, the next kind of synthetic paper that I wrote, and that's the paper that's known as the Matthew Effects paper, uh, that, that tried to put together a developmental model of, of how um, interactive compensatory processing was operating, uh, where these individual differences that we were seeing were coming from, um, the importance of phonological processing, the decoding process, but then the, the issue that is developed in uh, um, the Matthew Effects paper is, is, is uh, uh, one that, uh, that uh, you know, your, um, your series is developing, and, and that is the, uh, uh, the issue of the cumulative and knock-on effects of um, I uh, individual differences in reading fluency. And um, uh, the Matthew Effects paper puts together a developmental model, but also makes some speculations about these feedback effects, which I know you're uh, quite interested in. Um, we can take a moment, and, and I, 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 Anne spoke to this a little bit. Put your own version of why you called it the Matthew Effect, what the Matthew Effect is. And you're right. I mean, one of the things I'm interested in, and it just came out in your reading of Whitehurst, you hit that, but it seems like we have the Matthew effect and the downward spiral of shame. And that you could almost talk about this field in those two terms. Um, you, uh, yeah. What happens to a child? That's right. You have the positive. You, you, well, uh, another way to, yeah, the, 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 the positive effects, uh, the positive Matthew effects and the negative Matthew effects, what your, uh, your downward spiral. So, um, so basically, uh, the, the history is uh, that, that I stole the term from uh, an educational psychologist by the name of Herb Wahlberg, who had already used the term Matthew effects after the biblical passage, uh, for unto he that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance, but uh, for he that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. And he had, he had uh, actually the term had been used in the, uh, the sociology of science by, uh, by uh, Robert Merton uh, to describe, interestingly enough, scientific careers. <laughs> okay, you're, you're interviewing in, these, in this series all of us who have benefited from a positive Matthew effect, uh, <laughs> that you, you get a little bit of fame uh, early and then it builds on itself. And so Merton had this article in 1968 in which he'd, he'd used the term Matthew effect to describe scientific careers. Herb Wahlberg, um, in, uh, uh, and uh, again, I, I'll send you the references in articles that, whose uh, year I r r don't recall, uh, had um, uh, uh, talked about Matthew effects with respect to achievement in general, okay, um, including educational achievement. Um, um, but, but also other um, um, occupational endeavors. Uh, and then I stole the term <laughs> third hand, I guess, from, uh, from Wahlberg and, and used it uh, specifically uh, as a term to model effects that are going on uh, in the reading process itself to embed um, uh, the idea of cumulative advantage and disadvantage effects in, um, in a, a developmental model of reading. Um, so that's kind of where the term, uh, uh, the term has come from. Uh, and then um, we, we can describe it uh, from, uh, from either angle, as you say, the positive and the negative uh, angle. Uh, Wahlberg had focused on the cumulative advantage effects um, that uh, uh, you, you, um, uh, you have uh, well-developed uh, phonemic representations, hence uh, you struggle less uh, with the code, uh, and um, your phonological decoding is good, so you recognize words well very early in your reading experience. If you recognize words very well, you have a lot of capacity left over for the high-level comprehension processes we were just, just talking about. If you have a lot of capacity for those, stories are interesting <laughs> because you're thinking about them, and the stories are interesting, so you read more, uh, and you read more, and you develop more of those decoding processes, uh, and and um, uh, and then interestingly, what I developed in the Matthew effect, effects paper is even when um, when uh, let's say you 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 
you get to further stages of reading where decoding processes are, are uh, asymptoting and, and other types of high level inferential uh, processes are coming online. Well, you have a built in advantage there because all of this reading you've been doing has been building declarative knowledge. It's been building lexical distinctions. It's been building vocabulary, all of the things that you're going to need, let's say post fourth grade uh, as well. And this is a particularly important spot. We just went from Matthew effect into what reading does for the mind as far as reading as a cognitive exercise environment for making the kind of distinctions and critical uh, reflection and extension into uh, vocabulary differentiation and into the world that we just don't do if we don't read. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, uh, I, I, I titled a paper, you know, does reading make you smarter? Uh, uh, precisely to provoke people to think about this. Uh, and uh, the conclusion of, of the paper was the answer is yes. If you, if you uh, default to what is pretty much a consensus view um, of, um, of intelligence nowadays. I mean, the, the, a consensus view is the so-called horn cattell fluid crystallized model. Okay, where where I mean you can and and again I I don't want to burn all our interview talking about that intelligence is a hugely complex area but there is a consensus view that certainly there are there are two really separable domains of intelligence separable in the sense that they are separately neurologically damaged they show separate developmental trends a separate uh, a loss with aging so on and so forth. So-called fluid intelligence, abstract problem solving, and the so-called crystallized intelligence, okay, declarative knowledge, vocabulary, lexical distinctions, um, um, verbal facility, okay. Certainly, I think now since the Matthew Effect paper, since some of the work that our group has done, but many other groups on uh, the effects of reading, the effects of exposure to print, uh, Crystallized intelligence is just massively built by um, reading itself, okay? Independent of education, independent of fluid intelligence, okay? Regardless of what your levels of abstract problem solving are, you build declarative knowledge, you build lexical distinctions uh, with reading, and reading is uniquely efficacious. I, I noticed in your interview with Ann Cunningham, this, this issue came up. Um, some some work I always um, point to when I talk with teachers on this is is uh, uh, by a psycholinguist uh, by the name of Don Hayes. Uh, I, th I think she mentioned this to you, uh, where uh, he's um, looked at at um, what he calls the lexical density, okay, of um, text of various types, and in particular the distinction between oral language and uh, and a written language. So if you if you take a transcript off a network television show or the transcripts from let's say hospital waiting room conversation or or whatever, you can compute uh, indices uh, of of uh, lexical rarity, and they're they're quite interesting statistical uh, um, uh, indices um, of let's say the relative rarity of a word. In 10,000 words or in a thousand words, how, how many words will you encounter that are outside, let's say, the basic uh, 5,000 word lexicon? Okay. And if vocabulary is going to grow after the fourth grade, then necessarily you have to be exposed to such words. Well, how often is that going to happen in texts of various types? What are different venues that children or adults may find themselves in and which words that are uncommon to their native, to their common oral language are going to occur enough for them to have any exposure and learn them? That's, exact, that's exactly it. Well, and, and what Hayes has shown is that the, the factors is just enormous. It's, it's 5 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1 that a written source is going to give you more of just those exposures, okay? Uh, and so there's every reason to believe that print is, is uniquely uh, efficacious on the side of crystallized intelligence. So, so if, if crystallized knowledge is, is part of your concept of intelligence, and it is for 90% of the theorists out there, then in fact, reading does make you smarter. Um, and so post-Matthew effect, 
uh, uh, some of the work um, that our groups have been doing, and this is work that involved both Ann Cunningham and Richard West, uh, was again to try to nail down uh, some of those conjectures uh, empirically, all right, uh, in a statistical way um, that again, as I mean, I'm proud of the Matthew effects paper, but there were a lot. There was a lot in there that was speculation at the time it was written. Okay, um, we've tried correlationally to show uh, that the growth of vocabulary uh, is uh, uniquely linked to how much reading a person does. Okay, partialing out all all the other things that people would would. Uh, would think of as alternative hypotheses, like, for instance, a, a well, of um, their vocabulary is growing faster because um, they're just smarter, and smarter people induce more vocabulary uh, from the world. Okay, uh, well, that's true. Okay, but that's not all that that vocabulary is, and so you can handle that statistically um, by a. a, a, a what are called statistical regression techniques, where you partial out the effects of previous ability. So and then you're developing instrumental filters to really determine or be able to peer into just where are these, where's the vocabulary coming from uh, and how does that relate to reading? Exactly. It's not, a, it's not enough just to show a, a correlation between a lot of reading and big vocabulary. That, that would be called the zero order correlation. It's not enough to nail things down. Why any experimental psychologist, right, the f on the first day of graduate training, actually even before as an undergraduate, you learn that correlation does not imply causation. Uh, you learn to track down all those alternative variables that might be linking the two, okay? And I, I just mentioned one. Well, cogn basic cognitive ability. People with high cognitive ability uh, have higher vocabularies and they like to read more. So there's your linkage. It's not a causal link. Okay. So you use these techniques of statistical regression to take out that effect statistically. Uh, in other experiments, it's much more difficult. The best thing to do is, of course, run a true experiment. Well, in some of these areas, that's very difficult to do. In these areas of educational psychology development, we can't we can't assign children to a certain group and assign them to yeah, another group. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to condemn some. There's obvious ethical issues. Yeah. Uh, okay, so a lot of this work is correlational, but some some very elegant correlational techniques have come online. Actually, since I mean, I did a, a, a lot of the work in our group in the uh, '80s and early '90s. Were were just done with basic regression techniques. You've you now have structural equation modeling and and much better ways of taking into account measurement error, much better techniques than we actually used in the original work. Uh, but the point is that all this work is is converging as as close as we can say. Uh, you know, reading is a unique facilitator of all these areas of declarative knowledge. Um, <clears throat> the fluid intelligence. I mean, there's people that I've read or people of work I've encountered that suggest that um, becoming uh, readers created a quality of uh, reflexiveness with respect to language in general that oral language doesn't have that, that, that has given us a, an abstract distance that has changed how we think, not just what we think about and the differentiations we make in the more declarative sense, but our capacity and range, the dimensions of our abilities for abstraction. Uh -huh. we, we've looked at that a little. I, I'm, I'm going to take two cuts at that. Okay. What, what I think might be true <laughs> and, and what I can show empirically, okay. which are two different things. All right. I appreciate okay. that with you in particular. Uh, um, yeah, certainly, um, you know, one of my uh, colleagues uh, two doors down from me at the University of Toronto is David Olson, and uh, is, also, is someone that you might want to, uh, uh, to talk with for this uh, uh, series. Um, he, he's written some classic papers on the issue of how reading and writing um, restructures thought. Um, and uh, in particular, in areas of um, um, fostering decontextualization ability. Okay, um, one of my other my my other area of research interest is the is the area of critical thinking. And you've you've just made a very nice link between the two. Okay, 
because key key components of uh, critical thinking are the ability to abstract, um, to to strip off irrelevant context from situation to see an underlying rule. Um, to cognitively decontextualize, which, by the way, that operation I mentioned earlier of decoupling is a particular type of decontextualization. Okay, when we run alternative worlds in our brains, we're 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 decoupling, we're decontextualizing from our immediate context again, which is why some theorists think it was evolutionarily dangerous. <laughs> okay, not to not to track the world. There there had to be a big advantage to decoupling. This is the uh, David Abrams point, which I mentioned to you before. The the notion of what it's how writing and the level of uh, generalization that it brings forth and abstraction that it brings forth has decoupled us or allowed us to have a different distance from the stream of nature that we came from with all the good and bad that go with that. Yeah, that well, that type of, yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not familiar with the Abrams work, but that resonates with the type of, of thing that I'm, right. uh, I'm referring to. Uh, it's an imaginative leap to decouple from your immediate contextual surround, okay? And the idea that, uh, that David Olson uh, wrote about was that certain types of, of writing styles, um, in particular the essayist style that, that he talked about in a classic um, paper of his in Harvard Educational Review in the 1970s, uh, fosters um, this type of thinking because you, you cannot assume common knowledge with the audience. You have to establish every, uh, every premise in, in that type of writing. Um, um, it's not uh, me saying to my wife, um, boy, wasn't John Loopy at the party? And she goes, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Well, there's almost, not a shared context. Almost, yeah. Okay. The SES context is you have to establish every premise, right? It's it's the you know the type of thing we we teach in in higher writing in universities. Okay. Uh, you no, you can't assume an audience who agrees with you. That's when we teach critical thinking to undergraduates, right? They're forced to model the positions of. Uh, an opponent, okay, and and of course we even grade them on how well they do that. Did you think of a, an alternative explanations, okay? And all this is a type of decontextualization from what you actually believe. So there's a whole line of thought, yes, that that reading and and practice with particular types of writing uh, facilitate that. Now, uh, and I'm in tremendous sympathy with almost all of it, <laughs> okay. Showing that in a research sense is is real tricky. Okay, um, yeah, who's left uncontaminated? For some, yeah, <laughs> who's left on who's left uncontaminated? So the question is, can can you show it in a continuous way? Okay, that's going to be that's going to be trickier. Okay, we don't have any. These are what are what are sometimes referred to as the great divide theories. Right? There's there's a divide between literacy and and non literacy. Well, who's Again, who's not contaminated? Even if you're not reading that much, you're in a culture that's contaminated with these types of styles. In that our oral language reflects so many of the distinctions that came through the written loop. We can't say that our oral language right. is any longer any representation of the kind of more naturally emerged oral language that the written language came from. Oh, that's, a, that's exactly right. Um, you know, uh, the cognitive scientist uh, and philosopher Daniel Dennett, Yes. Talks about uh, talks about sequences just like that. Okay, when when he he uh, where and and uh, and also Andy Clark talks about this. How we take on so-called mind tools. Okay, and and we can upload them uh, so easily. Um, so we got a huge methodological difficulties though. Could, could, so is there enough variance left that? Um, that we could show it in a literate society. We, uh, we have all the other problems of spurious correlation that I talked about earlier. We did make some, uh, some very uh, initial attempts at this. Uh, the, well, the final methodological problem is how do you measure it? Okay, I mean, again, my background is cognitive and experimental psychology. 
Okay. It's so and, real if you can contrive some kind of way to measure it. How can you measure it? <laughs> how can you manipulate it? That's that's deep in our bones, Richard West and myself and Ann Cunningham. I mean, that's in our bones. Uh, uh, that's how an experimental psychologist is going to approach it different than a philosopher or someone from the humanities. Um, and and so there's a host of issues there. Now we have made, and again, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna downplay these attempts. I mean, we've taken some standard tasks from the critical thinking literature. Um, that uh, people use to study uh, decontextualizing abilities. I've actually, in passing, mentioned one or two. When 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 people argue, how often do they model uh, an alternative view? Um, there's a whole set of work on syllogistic reasoning. Okay, looking at uh, whether whether people can follow syllogistic logic when it contradicts real wor world beliefs. Okay, and and so um, um, as, all as, as an indication of their ability to, to decouple. Yes, exactly. Okay, exactly. All it, all flowers are uh, red. Uh, roses are red. Therefore, roses are flowers. Uh, now, in fact, that's not a valid syllogism. Okay, uh, but uh, and it's incredibly hard to see why it isn't. Because all of the real world knowledge, if I got it correctly, uh, all of the real world world knowledge is 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 right, firing off in our brains. True, true. That's right. That's right. True. Roses are red. Okay. But logical validity is asking you something else. Did it actually follow from the premises? Okay. Uh, if if you take that content away and say all X or Y and and put in abstract terms, people can do the problem, okay? If you put conflicting real-world knowledge, they have difficulty. Why? It takes the type of decontextualization and decoupling. Because each step's priming them to go on to the next one feeling good about it. Okay, to default, that's right, to, to, to default to those uh, uh, autonomous processes we have. Uh, and in fact, I've, 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 I've written about these types of, of kind of dual processes in, in uh, my latest book, but, but um, everything is telling us to default that way. So there's a bunch of tasks out there uh, that measure how well people do this. We put those tasks into some of our paradigms for measuring amount of reading, okay? Um, and um, we, we uh, and again, using these regression logics that I've talked about, parceling in out the third variables that people would say, oh, it's in just intelligence. No, we've parceled that out statistically. Oh, it's just education. No, we've parceled that out statistically. Okay, uh, we've put it in those paradigms. We have found a small effect on those types of tasks. Nowhere near as large as it is for something like vocabulary, where wing, reading ha accounts for what statisticians call this extra leftover variance after you've already partialed things is the unique variance. Okay, uh, you get massive unique variance for something like vocabulary. For these types of decontextualization tasks, it's significant, but you know, it's just not as big. Okay, those have been our empirical attempts. So those are kind of my two responses. Is but that's a, that's that's more of an artifact or a reflection of our inability to get a good uh, test around it. To get yeah, we, we, around we would it, like to rather think than it. than it being conclusive that there isn't a better correspondence. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I would I would I would agree with that. That's why I say on the theoretical end. <laughs> a lot of enthusiasm. If I, if you're forcing me to answer that as a good psychology right, experimental right, right, psychologist right. should, then I have to pull pull okay, back right, my horn. I just wanted to make sure we were framed together on that one. I, I have to pull back my horn. Well, uh, before we leave the the print exposure work, there's a there's another way um, without talking about the statistical uh, complications of regression analyses. There's a better way to talk to a general audience about this, uh, which which I uh, 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 often use. Uh, statistically, it's telling you nothing new, but it's much more understandable for people. Where we we have partitioned our groups, so we have a group uh, of people who have been measured in how much they read. We we have a group of people, and the same people we we will also measure their reading comprehension ability. Um, or their intelligence, all these other all these other variables, and of course, there's a correlation between the two. There's you know 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6, whatever it is. Uh, nonetheless, you can you can still partition the sample into high and low comprehenders, 
high and low print exposure, okay, the correlation is not so large that you don't have appreciable people in the two outlying cells, the two oddball cells, okay? People uh, who um, have fairly low comprehension abilities, but despite that, read a lot. And the so-called illiterates, uh, the people who on all the skill tests come out really well, but don't read much. Then you look at some of these other uh, indicators. So for instance, you, you, you look at um, uh, fine-grained vocabulary distinctions, okay? Uh, often, uh, the avid reader low comprehenders will actually outscore the other outlying group on these, uh, on these measures of vocabulary. You can actually get a crossover, okay? That's a more compelling way than talking about the arcane regression techniques to actually show a general audience the impact. Okay, uh, that you build, that's the positive side of Matthew effects. Uh, that, that is, the, no matter how, how hung up or unhung up you are on notions of ability, uh, avid reading builds crystallized knowledge regardless of what your background ability is. Okay, and so these kind of crossover designs where we look at these, the, you know, the A literates versus the avid readers uh, are kind of a nice way of showing that. Um, you, you also, I mentioned kind of the crystallized fluid difference to you before. So there's the well-known finding that, uh, that aging has differential effects on fluid and crystallized intelligence. Okay. Uh, bad news first, uh, you, you and I are well beyond the peak of fluid intelligence. Okay. <laughs> Which peaks in the twenties and, uh, and then has us, uh, um, Gradual decline. Gradual, really gradual <laughs> decline until right near the end. Uh, the upside, uh, the upside for us. So. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the bad news is the fluid part, okay, you and I are well beyond the peak, um, uh, which is in the 20s and then has a gradual drop off until the very end. Uh, but, but the upside is crystallized intelligence, uh, which, uh, uh, which continually, uh, um, which, which again grows with a nice uh, slope. Uh, and, and again, doesn't slope down until really acute stages before death. Um, and it's very startling um, to, to have Richard West uh, and I did uh, a study of um, print exposure across the lifespan. And we had 70-year-olds and all the way down to um, uh, uh, college uh, students. And it, I mean, it's just very startling to see the performance of the two groups. So, so you have something like you know, an abstract reasoning task, these nonverbal, uh, you know, matrices where you have to find, find the one that goes in the slot, like the Raven matrices, you know, for instance. And the, uh, I mean, the college students are, are a standard deviation and a half above the 70-year-olds. And then you hand them a vocabulary test. And it exactly, it exactly reverses, okay? It's just, it's just quite startling to see see the turnover. Well, what, uh, uh, what a, um, a gerontological uh, psychologist by the name of Tim Salthaus at University of Virginia has uh, um, uh, done is, is he, 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 he does these analyses in which you can focus on, you know, what is the variable that is accounting for either the decline uh, uh, or uh, the gain. And there's been, of course, a lot of uh, uh, work in neuropsych, you know, focused on the decline, uh, not as much, you know, focused on the gain. So we, we ran, and again, I won't get into the statistical details of Salthouse's analysis, but, but we ran it on the crystallized, you know, part of our study. And again, we had print exposure measures on uh, all of these people, the amount of reading that they did. And again, it's the same old conclusion that what, what in, 
is in, um, largely accounting for the positive slope is the amount of reading someone is doing independent of educational level, independent of the, the, uh, of the, of the first alternative hypotheses that people would think of. Oh, well, they're, you know, so on. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're college it's, graduates. They only got this far in school. So they, the first, they the general exactly. consensus. Is the first cut is education. Exactly. And your tests are revealing, no, the first cut really is print exposure. It is print exposure. That's right. And, um, and so again, um, our, our work kind of fits in with the, with the, the fluid crystallized um, uh, kind of models quite well. I don't, I don't, I don't recall what uh, where I was going with that, but anyway. <laughs> well, we had gone off on uh, on, on the uh, two different forms of intelligence and the effect that reading may have in developing them. And I had asked, we went into a little uh, track on uh, on the general generalization, abstraction, and so forth, and just came back to close on. Okay. Uh, the crystallized side with its trajectory through adults and the, how that, again, reconfirms the uh, correlation with print. There's this, uh, there, there's just, just, just also an, a, a kind of little oddball study that Ann Cunningham and I did at one point where we, where we looked at uh, what we called the, the cognitive anatomy of misinformation. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and uh, what we were looking for in the in the domain of reading was was is 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 reading you know an inoculation against misinformation. I've I focused on the positive, and you know reading builds information, uh, but we uh, we 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 isolated. And again, this was done uh, about a decade ago in the early '90s. Uh, you know, a bunch of 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 kind of common. Uh, uh, m misconceptions that people have, or 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 um, or or big things that people get wrong. Uh, so so uh, one of them, and if I'd have prepared for this, I, I would have gotten the list. But but uh, one has to do with the uh, the um, the prevalence of the major religions in the world. Okay, and so um, people um, underestimate. Um, uh, how many people of the Jewish faith there are, and 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 uh, uh, overestimate, and they underestimate how many people of the Islamic faith there are. Okay, and then another one, uh, another one concerns general information, like like uh, pe uh, people tend to confuse who who the allies and who the Axis were in World War II and when, and there were some, and when did, you know, Russia switched and so what, what was who? And, uh, and uh, I can't remember them all, but there's a, there's a series of these, kind of of these misnomers fundamental that, things yeah. that people get wrong. Okay. And again, we did one of those kind of regression analysis. We, now we looked at, uh, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, in this study, we looked at uh, exposure and uh, to other media. Okay, uh, electronic media, television, reading. Uh, again, educational level, intelligence. Okay, and again, we found that reading was a huge what, what we'd call an inoculating factor against a whole series of misconceptions that people have about the world. Okay, people who read a lot disproportionately didn't believe the crazy things. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the bottom line was was that controlling for all the obvious confound again, you know, education, intelligence, etc. Uh, uh, people who who read a lot, okay, disproportionately don't believe the misconceptions. Okay, so it's like and, and, and you weren't you weren't filtering by what they're reading. It, it, just generally, the more they read, the less likely they are to fall into the pitfall yeah. of various misconceptions that uh, abound. That's right. That's right. And we we in some of these studies we looked at uh, people always ask us about genre effects, uh, and and we've done some analyses of that type. 
uh, but on a gross measure, like if, if you're kind of grossly measuring vocabulary, you don't get a lot of genre effects. I'm sure if you looked at something more fine grained, you would. Okay, but uh, you know we we've looked at fiction, nonfiction, and things like that in in uh, in that work. There's a lot more work there to be done. So there's a lot more depth of differentiation that you could do, but still, even in its its kind of general fuzzy state, it's still it's making the case. Yeah, even in the general fuzzy state. And note that it's a similar problem here. We we have a problem with the grossness of the behavioral indicators. It's like with the critical thinking work on decontextualization and and the syllogisms. We don't have a lot of refined indicators for some of these effects that we think are there. I mean, it's it's the it's the uh, experimental psychologist struggle. You know, of of people can think up all these um, these fascinating things to study. This is a this is well, I'll you know I'll mention a pet a pet peeve okay along along these lines with measurements. Here's the experimental psychologist's pet peeve. I, I often have people knock on my door. Often someone I've not met before, a graduate student from somewhere else in the building, and says, you know, so everyone's been telling me I should talk with Key Standards because I I, I have this incredible idea. I, I have I have this wonderful idea. Let me tell you about it. And they they tell me about the idea. And and then they say now now I, I came to you because there's just there's just there's just little pieces that's you know missing you know I just I don't know how to test it yeah okay <laughs> and now the implication is of course that they've done ninety five percent of the work and they've come to me so I can help them with the little five percent on the end okay in experimental psychology it's just the opposite okay coming up with an idea is five percent finding out how to cash it out into something that's measurable. All right, is ninety five percent of the struggle. Okay, that's again the you know a linkage to that kind of pre prehistory era of reading um, that I mentioned before. Uh, one way to view the way the fields come in the past thirty years is we've we've reversed that ninety five five. We've right. done the hard part. Okay, there were, I mean, there were all kinds of, the, the 70s were the area, era of what is sometimes called the global models of reading, these, these kind of sweeping statements. And again, Smith's book was one, although I, I don't mean that to sound pejorative, because it was a very creative synthesis that inspired us. You brought it us. to a point where you could where you get a handle on the collective of thinking at that state. Yeah, exactly. Nothing wrong with that. Right. But at some point, you got to do the 95-5 switch. You got to do the hard work of finding measures of how to measure these things and how they cash out. And that's what we've done in the last 25 years in the reading area. All the things you're reading about, how context works, all those priming paradigms that we imported from experimental psychology, all of the work on phonological awareness that, that you're aware of and, and all the way down the line. We can, we can now cash these things out with measurement and, you know, we can, we can test them, and then, and then, of course, theory is going to continue to go to to get even more fine grained, um, uh, mapping up with the neurophysiological work, and everything like that. I mean, that's the way to view this this kind of the field that I entered as 1970, and the field that you're summarizing now and talking to all these people. Okay. You want to take a break yourself? Alrighty. Alrighty. Our, uh, they they were syn synth synthetic types of things. Now the field, um, again, uh, uh, it, it was a real nice time to be in the field. It was almost a sweet spot because you could get your arms around almost almost all of it. Now that's, you know, actually no longer true from a scientific point of view. Uh, I mean, you're, you're trying to get a, a kind of a high level picture uh, of the earth as a satellite, but if you have to work down close, it, it's, it's, and this is actually a good thing, but, but it's, it's kind of no longer possible to get your arms around uh, all of it. Okay. Because we, you know, we, we've got, um, Again, the whole the whole neurophysiological area has taken off, uh, and and uh, uh, you know the 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 eye movement technologies and and all all the various technologies for for uh, for studying the components. Right. Um, I had and a great conversation with uh, Keith Rayner. Yeah. Interview him yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. Terrific. You know, I, what you can infer from that. You know? 
I mean, there's a there's a wonderful example. I mean, I think, I mean, some of the um, the Rainer. Um, I mean, the classic studies were were not until the late 1970s. I mean, so so when 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 that's a, a good juxtaposition to some things I said earlier. So in that 1971 book by Smith, there's all kinds of these conjectures about visual pickup during word word recognition. Okay, and and, and well that that you know you wouldn't process certain features of redundant letters, for instance, because the redundancy allows you to fill that in. And, and again, in ways that, I repeat what I said earlier, that were quite plausible, actually, to a cognitive psychologist at the time. Uh, it seemed analogical to other modes of processing. Exactly. Uh, but then we found that the analogies didn't carry through in the way, in the way that we thought. And when, when uh, Keith Rainier and George McConkie uh, started actually doing those studies of removing little, you know, no, guess what? We are picking them up. And, and you know, that, that makes a point. I, I, I said a, a, f a few minutes ago, kind of a, an important theme for an outsider coming to this field is that, is that introspection wasn't always a good uh, model for how things went. And just in the, in the 30 minutes we've been talking now, we've, we've stumbled on a number of things. I mentioned context effects. We just talked about the eye movements, uh, the exact role of phonology, when, when it's cutting in and when it's not. All right. All those things had to be studied by kind of the online um, techniques of, you know, the cognitive scientists that, uh, I mean, introspection. Heck, with respect to eye movements, introspection wouldn't even give you very well the fact that you're making saccadic movements, that, that, that you're not flowing <laughs> uh, freely across. So a number of ideas have actually emerged from doing measurements, from doing research, rather than uh, from philosophical uh, ideation that then got research to support it. It came up from, like Keith's work. Yeah, it came up exactly. It 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 uh, uh, it bubbled up, ironically, bob bottom up, uh, and probably has what what has made some of the insights so hard to absorb. I know you've talked about with Reed and other people about the difficulty of absorbing some of the insights, and 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 I think that's probably one of the reasons sometimes people's introspections. Um, don't map what the research which says. Comes, which we're going to come to in the latter part of our time together, which, which is ultimately what the challenge is if we really cared about these children. That's how do we develop um, a, a new mode of communicating all of this so that we don't have to be, to be lost in the detail at the level you were describing that a modern scientist can't keep their hands all around this, but yet that all this work can lead to... Um, parents and teachers having a new fundamental general orientation to this process that's more healthy and aligned with mm -hmm. what's necessary. Right. And I, again, I see from the interviews that you've been working, you've, you're, you're yourself working on giving some of those new frameworks. And I think in ways that are convergent with what uh, what research scientists have been finding Thank about you. this, the whole... The whole issue of, of course, nat reading being natural and unnatural came up, comes up in your interviews, and and of course your 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 view, you, the the framework you're putting on this is very uh, convergent with what I'd call the 30 year. I I I gave a talk and kind of framed it as you know the 30 year consensus, i.e. the consensus that we've arrived at after 30 years of concentrated cognitive science on this problem. Okay. Good. Why don't you give us the five And that's a whole... Highlights. Well, that. well, I was talking about that consensus. We need to do a shift before we get... Sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. It's just from when we got... Did I move? Yeah, I'm going to roll you over right about there. Good. Thanks. Okay. 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 There you go. Am I, am I there if I look this way? Oh. You're fine. You're okay. fine okay. looking right here. And him, yeah, we had moved over, and so this box was trying Shift to climb in your eye. Yeah. 
well, I can't, I can't summarize all the, I mean, I, I've actually been talking about that consensus in passing, but I, I, I'm, I'm um, referring specifically to some of the discussions you've had about um, uh, reading being a natural or an unnatural process. And, and I took you back to the root. Now you, you're, you're well aware of this, of the history of the waxing and waning of these ideas, but I'm, I'm gonna focus on us on just the, the, the modern period. We won't go back to Horace Mann and all the rest. <laughs> all right, in the modern period, um, the notion that learning to read was, was a natural process um, came from uh, the influence of the top-down theorists of the 1960s and early 1970s, and Ken Goodman's writings and, and Frank Smith's writings that, that became in its, in its modern incarnation the, the whole, whole language approaches. And, and, but at the, at the root of the, the philosophical appeal of those approaches has been the notion that reading is natural. The psycholinguistic guessing game uh, idea um, that, that we predict and use redundancy. Uh, recall that I said that, that West and I found the, the issue plausible. Um, that uh, um, cognitive psychology was, was full of, um, of demonstrations Want me to? Just want to have a quick look here. Oh, okay. Sorry to interrupt. It's okay. Go ahead and look like you're um, talking with him, right over here, like you're looking at David. Yes. Oh, okay. Sure. Hard to see. It's hard to see now because more now. Have I come out again? Have I? <laughs> it's, it's close. Let's put, let's pause and do one more adjustment of the lights because that is so close to being borderline music. Okay. I'm getting half of the eye in the okay. box. Okay. All right. Let's pause right here. We know where we're at. When? Okay. So let's go back to the root of the modern incarnation of this. And, and again, it's, uh, I'm being egocentric. This is the root of where, and when well, I came into the field, right, right. <laughs> I'm sure everyone is doing this to you. Um, but, uh, but it, 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 I came into the field when, when the, the top down models that were kind of the philosophical fuel for the later whole language approach were reigning quite high. Um, Ken Goodman's psycholinguistic guessing game and um, Frank Smith's uh, writings on the importance of redundancy had us all focused on uh, the naturalness of the reading process, how that it was, it was quite natural to use all of this contextual information uh, to uh, facilitate recognition. And again, cognitive psychology is full of demonstrations like this. Um, one, and if I can make a link here to my early interactive compensatory model, one thing we, where, where I think those theories went wrong, and this is total hindsight, uh, I, I myself didn't know this in the early 70s, but where we went wrong was that, that the analogy uh, is a, about the, the, the actual stimulus situation was misplaced. Many of these demonstrations in cognitive psychology were showing how we used information to facilitate recognition when the stimulus was degraded, okay? Uh, natural speech is a good example because it's pretty fuzzy when you clip, okay? Uh, and, and but, but potentially in reading, um, the actual stimulus can be uniquely specified. It's not, it's not fuzzy in the way that some of these demonstrations were in cognitive psychology. So there's a lot of uh, classic demonstrations. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> Excuse me. There's a lot of classic demonstrations in, in uh, uh, cognitive psychology um, 
you know, showing how we can disambiguate stimuli when we have a lot of information, okay? Um, but of course, the printed word on a page can disambiguate itself, okay? If we, if we know the code for it, or if we have its, or, if we have its correct orthographic representation, uh, and this was the heart of the interactive compensatory idea that that you may you 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 need all this compensation when you have poor decoding skills. Uh, so anyway, this this was kind of the philosophical fork in kind of the natural unnatural debate. Phil Goff, who I, I don't know if whether he's on your you know interview list, but but he um, again tried to combat these notions at about the same time I wrote the interactive compensatory paper, Goff wrote a paper simply titled, Reading is Unnatural. <laughs> and and um, um, that was kind of at the heart of the divergence of these, these two approaches and when we had a lot less evidence. Would you like to recalibrate it? Let's keep running. I'll talk. I'm not on the camera anyway. Okay. So, so we had, you know. It seemed to me that it would, it, there'd be two distinctions here that, that it would be obvious that reading is unnatural, but that it might be learned through a natural, more natural processes. Mm. Right? Rather than reading is natural or unnatural in this big global. Mm hmm. I mean, clearly, reading is unnatural. Mm -hmm. But the question is, can we learn it in a way that's that's has a greater affinity to the way we naturally learn other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, you raise a good point. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that um, that that debate gets gets a little confusing. I mean, that, th this is the thing that's constantly confused and. In these debates um, uh, about what the mere characterization of something implies for implies for teaching it, um, and th and this can go two ways, okay? Because as again, some of your early interviewees uh, have talked about, um, because the phoneme is abstract. And because the code is somewhat irregular in, in the case of English, doesn't mean that someone with well-articulated phonological representations and someone who got a lot of practice couldn't induce everything they, they need. And of course, this is, this is the large number of children who just learn to read no matter what we do. Okay, <laughs> and, and, and I love uh, uh, the, uh, the comment in your interview with Reed that I read last night. He said, just, I mean, some kids are so well prepared that they learn no matter what, whatever cockamamie method we use, but it doesn't mean that they learn because of the cockamamie method. <laughs> okay, and, and, um, and, and so again, I think that was the fact that you have large groups of children doing fine in this way uh, was something that helped us, um, that, that, that I, I, I think prevented us uh, from, um, from arriving at, at, at a more accurate model of what the process was. Okay. Could they would lend themselves to the, it's natural. Yeah, that 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 would clearly lend itself to to the view that that it was natural, um, but you know, of course, a lot of us are, you know, focused on the issue of <laughs> what about the the people who don't learn. Yeah, when you and, say you know the the majority or a great number of, I mean, um, as you probably also heard in, or read in that Reed Lion thing, I mean. Yeah. Uh, you know, eighty, and you go by the NAEP statistics. Eighty-eight percent of of fourth grade uh, African American children are below proficiency. Yeah, it, it it certainly depends on where you are, <laughs> where where you are teaching exactly, um, and um, yeah. So I mean, it's one of the ironies of of this 
of this, well, you know, the politics of this whole debate that, 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 um, I've lost my thread a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, um, This is um, when you have to do something. So, to get myself back on track, <laughs> let's let's uh, maybe I could summarize not not only what we've been saying here, but again trying to interface with things I saw in your other interviews. Okay, that that what what you're seeing is a consensus that that you know Reed keeps asking where are the difficulties. Okay, well that's we we have a lot more consensus on that. Now, one, the phoneme is an abstract unit. Two, one of the things that you've emphasized, the code in English is not straightforward. Three, reading is not natural in the sense that children will, will default to the highest and most meaningful global level, okay? And that's not the level of the phoneme. Okay, and four, we have instructional problems because a lot of times teachers don't know points one, two, and three. Okay, <laughs> and 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 so the heart of the problem is the interaction of those four things. Okay, um, what can we do? Um, and, and certainly, point four is remediable. Okay, uh, that that teachers don't know points one, two, and three. <laughs> Right, and, and that's where there, there's the greatest inertia resisting any change. <laughs> At least that's the opinion of Matt most. There, oh, there's tremendous inertia. That's right in schools of education, and and uh, and um, again, people are working on that. And Cunningham is working on the issue of teacher knowledge. Uh, something that might be worth um, corresponding with her a little bit more about. Um, uh, because she, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll describe this study, but she's the principal author. I'm, I'm way down the author list, okay? Uh, and um, uh, she has um, looked at the nature of, of teacher knowledge, but not just what teachers know, but how well calibrated they are with respect to their knowledge. In a sense, again, she's, she's stealing concepts from my two areas of interest, critical thinking and reading, because the issue of knowledge calibration is really big in the area of critical thinking. As you, as you know, it's, it's, it's not only do you not know, but do you know that you don't know? Okay, it's the metacognitive calibration issue. And she has studied a large group of, of um, uh, teachers, several hundred, Teachers and she's looked at the calibration issue, so so yes, so you 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 and she's looked at in in two areas, uh, um, phonics and phonological awareness as one area, and the other area is knowledge of children's literature, okay, and and so all right, she finds what you might expect and what Louisa Motes and other people have found. Teachers don't know enough about phonemic awareness. They don't know as much as they should about phonics. Um, but what's even more interesting is they're poorly calibrated. They don't know that they don't know. Okay, They think they know as much as they need to, and they don't. Whereas, interestingly, in the other area, the teachers weren't poorly calibrated. Okay, um, They knew a reasonable amount about children's literature, and those who needed to know more knew that they needed to know more. Okay, uh, they were well calibrated. Uh, you know, you, you statistically you construct this thing called a calibration curve. Okay, and in the area of children's literature, they were well calibrated, but in the area of phonics and phonological awareness, they weren't well calibrated. Those who didn't know much thought that they did, and vice versa. The calibration curve was almost flat. Which speaks to the belief mechanisms associated. With yeah, that's that's right. If you don't if you don't know that there's anything there that you need to know, yeah. Because it, you believe you got it nailed, you got it wired. Yeah. So so why? What else? You know, what else is there to know? 
And uh, so you, you must talk with her about that study, though, because she's the... We dropped out uh, of communication when she was leaving Berkeley for oh, a while. She was, yeah, she was on a, a lecture tour and... Yeah, um, yeah, because I and, really enjoyed the interaction with her, and I, so I will follow she's up. She's back her. now. Good. Yeah. She's she's back now, but you should really uh, get in touch with her for the details of this study because it's not just uh, there's been a lot of work recently on this teacher knowledge issue. Louisa Motes is doing yeoman's work in 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 this area, but this calibration issue that Anne has put in is is a new twist to this. Okay, uh, that uh, that and and uh, and of course it's an exact crossover. It's not you can say well there's something wrong with it. They were actually well calibrated in the domain of children's literature. They knew what they knew, and they knew what they didn't know there. And yeah, which, which which implies that there's a different freedom to be uh, critically thinking, to be uh, aware, to be responsible, be responsible for your knowledge proficiency in this domain. In that domain, that's different than lining up with you know one of the herds on the reading thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, put it that's put right. It <laughs> you know. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I th I think there's a lot going on in this in this area of of teacher. I mean, it's it's not something that I've been involved in directly. I'm coming more from the research end. I mean, I've written a lot about the need for more s just scientific thinking in in the area of teacher education. Okay, um, teachers need to know more about the scientific process rather than being delivered findings by people like me. Yeah, this comes that, back to how is it that, that teachers become first person learners into this space rather than uh, extensions that are uh, deferring to the authority of somebody this, else's understanding. That's already. right, the latest person to come through the in-service circuit. Exactly, exactly. Become Fire that so that, that each the teachers see their interaction with children in this space as their learning lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that is right. And feel that they can evaluate evidence that comes at them. Okay. Um, so, so this, so we have this big scientific consensus, but in a sense, we, we, we haven't, given teachers the tools of scientific thinking so they can appreciate the consensus, okay? Um, it, it shouldn't be dependent, as I said, on, on, on someone like me saying, coming and saying, here's a conclusion, but they should be able to, to certainly read the literature themselves, okay, and decide for themselves, become autonomous. And, and, and I think knowing how to evaluate expertise is is a critical skill that we're not we're not giving teachers because they're everything that comes through in the latest in service is just the latest thing and it'll go away <laughs> okay and so right science's unique characteristic is it's cumulative it's cumulative knowledge okay um and it has its the and resistance to openness well. Oh sure, and uh, that's right, and and most particularly at the individual level, which is why to understand the unique strengths of science, you have to understand it as a social process. Okay, as an, an individual. Yeah, you don't ask. So so you you we teach you know the traditional you know Popperian views of you know falsification. Put your views out there, and of course we all try, but we all we we fall short, right? We go after our pet theory. Ah. But, but, all right, no problem in science. Because if I don't construct a, an experiment to really test an alternative to my theory, someone else will, okay? Someone else will make, make a name by knocking mine down. I'm, I'm embedded in a critical process, even if I can't carry it out myself. We all would love for individual scientists to, to carry that, that critique Within Every time I think of this, I think of uh, Lord Kelvin's proclamation to the uh, physics students in 1890s. Well, we got it all mapped well, up, but it's, it's coming into this field. It's all <laughs> over. That's right. <laughs> or I just thought it's more at other sides of the room, not in you know, all their students congregating, not wanting to talk to one another because they just couldn't agree on anything that they could move after. After. You know, 
relativity and you know, quantum mechanics and God doesn't roll dice and all that kind of stuff, so that there still is quite human dimension to science. To, but, yeah. that, and I think if we teach that more, it would seem more palatable to outsiders. Um, uh, the critical process has to be understood, but also the uh, sometimes in doing that, we obscure the cumulative nature of science. Um, and and um, we obscure that by focusing. There's, a, there's an odd thing about science that it's hard to convey. Uh, why are all these disagreements? Why are there all these disagreements in science? Because the disagreements are only at the place where things are interesting. And where things are interesting is where the disagreements are. I use this this. Um, diagram of concentric circles. I think I got it from Peter Medawar. And, and, you know, in the, in the middle are kind of the hardcore things, you know, that we call facts, you know, F equals MA. And then we have well-established theories. And then, and, and we create a, you know, I create a continuum of concentric circles. And, and, and then, and then of course you have an area out here, way out here that, that contains problems that aren't solvable by currently occur available empirical techniques. Okay, and then we ask, you know, where will good scientists congregate? Okay, and it's 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 all on the outer ring of this circle. The, in the middle, it's totally uninteresting. If you go too far out. You're dealing with problems that aren't solvable, like the experimental psychologist saying that's a good theory, but we can't measure that. Okay, everyone congregates at just the area where there is no agreement, and that's how the public gets the idea. Well, these scientists can never disagree. These scientists can never agree. The inverse of that, which really hit me hard, was that in my generation, in my situation, I grew up thinking because of the textbooks, because of the magazines, because of the science books that I read. Um, school in general, you grow up with a sense that somebody out there knows. We the tone of the oh. the, the textbooks up mm -hmm. to a certain stage in college is this is the way this is this is the way this is this is so this is so, and yet when you get to the real edge, you, like you're describing, sure. there's a raging uh, debate. Uh, there's a raging dialogue working itself out, extending and differentiating that edge. Yes. That's Which means to say that learning is a whole lot more important than this um, kind of assumption of it is so stability. That's right. That's that's actually yes, and that's where we do, yeah. That's where you do get to the contention, but but the but science is is kind of it's a really unique tension though, between between a conserving force and a force for for change and disruption. You're, okay, because I don't want to downplay the, the, the conserving force either. Uh, change in science is not like change in the arts. Okay, well, well a, a minor poet is elevated. <laughs> and, and the, uh, uh, you know, a novelist who was in the Pantheon is now out, okay, uh, or in, in uh, more extreme, the visual arts, okay. Uh, that change in science is not like that either. Uh, it, there's there's a conserving feature amidst all the change. Okay, so so yeah, there's a lot. You know, theories of reading will change and develop. Okay, but they still have to account for the old facts. It's the old story about Einsteinian relativity, not throwing out. Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics is now a special case. It follows through in the social sciences just as well. Okay, if okay, if some other reading theory that I can't conceive comes in the future, it is still going to have to tell me why that Lieberman tapping task shows a 0.5 correlation with reading in the in grade one. It's got to tell me that fact. Whatever the new theory is, that fact is not lost. This is it, what leads to the, the implicate order thinking of, this, of other uh, 
that, that, it, that it has to uh, almost, uh, like Kuhn described, subsume. It has to subsume the other facts. It may reinterpret them, but it doesn't, it it doesn't just throw out. It can't them. Yeah. It can't disregard them. It can't say, well, that, uh, those, that Victorian portrait photography that commanded a million dollars in 1890 is now no longer. The stairway it's, of science is not made of fads. Yeah, that's right, exactly. It's, and, 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 and so in emphasizing the change aspect, we don't want to lose the cumulative. It's the unique tension of change and criticism and the conserving feature of conserving what we know. And, and it's finding the middle. Right. This is kind of a tangent. It just leads back to, I mean, my general sense is, is that um, it, would be, it would be more helpful to children and to humanity in general to emphasize our... Um, living learning extension rather than our accumulative knowledge um, with this kind of it is so transmission that's going through school. And, and that has to do with the, the quality of exercise that we're bringing children into. What are we trying to, what are we trying to do? Get them to remember this fact, this fact, and this fact. Yes, that's important at one level or to be, um, nourishing and getting stronger and appreciating the vital necessity of their own first person learning. Yeah, well, I would I would I would argue that even in education, the scientific model is still a good one. You need you need to find the unique way of doing both. Okay. I mean that that when I so do I keep turning? <laughs> do I keep turning? When you turn there. Okay. The light just comes Okay. So that's what, when you see me doing that. Okay. Yeah. I, and um, I've been sit. <laughs> it's hard to sit still. <laughs> um, yeah. That that actually though gets me to the two. I I I, sh I should mention to you before you, you you leave just two thoughts I had after reading your your the other the other transcripts because I think there are probably two areas in talking to people in this field. You're, you're, you're talking to people that are part of this, A, that are part of this scientific consensus, but B, who have been through a particular history in, in that consensus, a history of um, the, well, the political wars in this field and the history of trying to get this knowledge um, uh, out there. And I noticed in the interview, I mean, there, there, there are two places, I think, where people are, are balking at, at your framework. And again, again I want to I I preface that by saying that, that the overlap is huge. The framework that you're putting on this is, again, is at least 90% there. It frames the consensus that we all know. Okay, but I think there's two small areas. I noticed that in the Reed interview, and I noticed that a little bit in the Vanesky interview, at, at least in the transcript, they didn't say it to you, but I think I know what's in the back of their minds. Good. And you're going to run into this with respect to other people as well. And, 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 there, are, and there are two points, okay? Um, one it's, is um, when, when we talk about the irregularity of the code. In English, okay, and and you've made it clear in the you know the transcripts that that you're interested in you know in the history of spelling reform, right? But that's not your that's you know that's not your bag here. I'm more interested right? in the ecology of learning. And yeah, and I'm looking at the code as a and the, and the whole confusing environment thing as, as understanding as a technology and looking at the code, and of course there's some um, there's some uh, recent work from the European groups, and if someone, probably Vineski already put you on to this, that, that the, the cost group in Europe that's looking at comparative um, reading progress in all, basically all, almost all of the languages of Europe, uh, arrayed on, on an, an orthographic depth continuum, and a comparison, Phil Seymour and Usha Goswami, most of these people are British, of course, you may be. There's a group in Ireland that I'd found that's actually done some comparative orthographic, uh, you know, reading, but nobody seems to have indexed 
No. But many different levels of ambiguity. This is an index. Different system this has. is what I'm referring to. Okay. Someone, I'm surprised that, that Dick didn't do this last September. The papers were actually, there were 2003 papers. Uh, Phil Seymour has an article in the, I, I, can give him, I, can, I can give you the citation before you leave or email it however, however you want. There, there, are two, there, are, there are three things that you sh should look at. Phil Seymour has summarized the results of this, of this cost group in Europe, COST, I forget what the acronym stands for, but they've cooperated with each other. Um, and I think they have over 10 languages in there and they have comparable groups of children and, and a whole continuum of performance on words and non-words, okay? And then uh, uh, Johann Ziegler and Usha Goswami. Uh, Ziegler has a paper in JECP, I'll also give you the citation for, and they jointly, I think Usha is really someone you should talk with. She's, in, at, 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 she's in, at a, in a chair in the Department of Ed at Cambridge, England. Um, they have a paper that's in press, so um, you would, in Psychological Bulletin, okay? And I can give you a PDF of it. Um, and this is the best work that's out there, definitely. Um, and comparing the levels of ambiguity exactly. associated with processing this whole lot of Exa reading. That's exactly right. Good. You need to you need to look at that uh, at that work, um, and um, and then uh, the, the the Seymour papers in British Journal of Psychology, and and it, and it does exactly what you want. It arrays all the languages of Europe, uh, uh, and and then. This paper by Ziegler in JECP looks specifically at, at uh, the patterns of, um, of uh, reading difficulty. Um, it's a bit more technical, but, but it, 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 it looks at, you know, are the sources of difficulty in a more regular orthography the same? And, but if so, how might they manifest differently? Well, yeah, I mean, there's just gender differences versus, I mean, there's so many different levels of potential confusion. Yeah, but yeah, that's, well, that's, that's right. You want the samples the same. You don't want to get into the things like gender. You, you want to, for you, at least for your, uh, uh, for, uh, for your purposes. But, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that stuff before you leave. But um, what, what you're finding when you start to go down the road of emphasizing the irregularity of, of English, is is some of us who've lived through this bad period in the over the early seventies when you had people saying, "Well, it's so damn irregular. It's, it's there's there's no use teaching a child to to." Okay, we've all been through that. You're talking to people who have been badly burned. I understand okay? that. I understand and, that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't challenge that. Yeah, that just means what all. all, all your point is that, that the added complexities of the English orthography give us more reason to be explicit, analytic, and transparent to children. That's a big part of it, yes. And there's another piece to this I want to share with you. But, yeah, I mean... The, okay. But it, that's it, not how people are going to read you, for, okay? That's why that you're going to... That there's some resistance I detected in the Vineski interview and the Lion interview, and I think you're going to get that again, and because I think people are going to worry about that. Frank Smith had many, lots of papers where you reproduce these passages, you know, that are unreadable because the old George Bernard Shaw, you know, goatee for fish, and 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 oh look at how crazy it all is. This is why they, this is why you got to focus kids on meaning because it's so crazy that they can't learn it. Yeah, that is I'm what you're going, running I'm into. I'm not going. I know. I, I I know you're not. But see, I had the advantage of reading some of these other transcripts. Yes. Okay. I I if you, and that was a big advantage, because I think if you come in starting to, f to throw the complexities of English at those of us who have been in these wars, uh, 
That's what. That's the worry you're going to kick up. But, but that, that's kind of like uh, that's a, a a version to the drag of it all. <laughs> I mean, oh. what gets me about all of this is that we're talking about children experiencing a form of confusion that's unnatural to their organism. I, 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 I think that's a that's an interesting and good way to frame things. And that they are they are they having a feeling. They're learning to associate feeling bad with that form of confusion. Yeah. No, I, I they are pre consciously learning to want to avoid that confusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if it's decapitating it, it their learning fits right in with the Matthew effect, and then yeah, exactly no the motivational side effects. Exactly. When you talk about the four things that are going on, the one exactly. thing that was implicit in all of them was the Matthew effect and in, in, in the negative side of it, yep. and, and that's not made explicit enough. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the, in the, the how children feel and how they automatically respond to how they feel in relation to this challenge is a big a part of this mm-hmm. as any of the other pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, that was that was just by way of a warning. Uh, no, okay. no, no, and I appreciate that a lot. Okay. Anne and said the same thing. If you read did, did, Anne's transcript. Yeah, I didn't read that whole thing. She said thing, the though. exact same thing. Right when we got into this spot, she said, but David, you have to be careful that you're not making it sound like it can't be taught. Exactly. She's, She's worried about the same thing. And the, and the other, uh, the, the other cl- it's, it's like you're taking people on a journey. Uh, but I'm telling you, you are next to a cliff edge. I understand. And, I mean, and really, all the if professionals. I was, if I wasn't all the way on one side or the other side, I'd have. I'd, I'd be just dismissed on one side. All, or the other side. All, all, all the professionals are worried about going off the cliff, and there's there there are other aspects of the the transcript too. When 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 you you started to talk about the the individualized learning and the. That 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 sounded like the romantic constructivism that was the philosophy behind whole language. Yeah, but it's there not. gets going to emerge from within the child. I could have a six-hour okay. conversation with we, Siegfried Engelman okay. and come to agreement. Yeah. Okay. Because Fine. what I'm talking about is is, is creating um, minimizing extraneous ambiguity. Right? Yeah, I'm exactly <laughs> no, I, and and I'm with you, but I'm saying you got to watch some of those buzzwords, yeah. okay? Because we all, but we we've, we've all got scars on our fingertips. We've all been burned, okay? And you get and and Anne, someone like Anne, who 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 is is interfacing a lot with educational policy, is going to worry how these things get translated by the time it reaches for the teacher. You and I can talk in depth about it here. OK, but the but the teacher is just like the he's like the president of the U.S. It's going to it's going to end up with a one pager. Right. You, you I hear you. I hear you. How I is this going to end up on a, with a one page buzzed. with a one pager? Right. OK. Right. All right. You, you so you have a big think tank that does a special, but it ends up on the president's desk as a one pager, which is okay? what happened in and, 1906 that caused this problem. And this is unfair. <laughs> And it's unfortunate that the teacher is going to end up with the one pager, and you got to watch, okay, that you don't go off either of those two cliffs. All right, that's that's I okay. I really anyway. respect and appreciate what you're saying. Other than other than that, as I say, because it because it destroys the ninety percent consensus that you've got with threatens the field. It, yeah. it threatens it. Okay, and that's what I saw in both those Reed line and the and the and the Vineski. They thought you were going over the cliff, and that's when you started to feel a little resistance. But what, what I'm really saying is that when you go back and you look at this, the 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 English uh, system that we have is a series of accidents. I mean, uh, Vineski points to Fisher. Fisher, you talk to Fisher. You know, twenty six scribes working for King Henry V yep. in the fourteen hundreds developed a way to transcribe. Mm-hmm. English using Roman and, and Latin uh, characters, and the people that are doing the transcription don't even speak English. It's a peasant language they don't care about. Mm-hmm. They're mapping over from another language, another sound system, and this is the beginnings that then gets yeah. mangled. It's a the clue, like process. the computer programming people talk about, right? Yeah, but there isn't a computer programmer it, in the world that would say this is a good ecology piece of code for a processor to run. Oh, exactly. <laughs> no, it's more analogous to evolution. 
yes. which is also a kludge, yes. built on top of each other. And the next and the next change has to be built on top. It can't replace. Okay, because right, because evolution, evolution finds function. local maxima. Right, right, right. And evolution has a has a, um, this long period of filtering out what's not going to work in a different way. There's a somatic. Uh, feedback cycles yeah. that are involved in what's going on. There's this variation and selection. 400, 500 years ago, that, that only a f you know ten or twenty generations had been. Well, it's closer to being a pure accident, like a, like a, like wiping out like a, a, an asteroid. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, I think it's, 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 it's Stephen Jay Gould's model. I was just going to say flamingo smile, right? It, it, it's it's a, Stephen Jay Gould. Yeah. It, it's punctuated equilibrium in the sense of. Uh, in this case, two different languages colliding and sorting themselves into something. All right. Um, I mean, yeah, and you've got great people. Well, I, unfortunately, you know, we've lost, we've lost Dick. I mean, that's unbelievable loss to the field because, because that it. it you no, know, you remember earlier I was talking about how, uh, you know, disparate the field has now become, and and you've got in an area like literacy. Right, you've got, you've got the quants, the statistical people, uh, the technology people, the neurophysiological people, and then you've got the humanists coming at at literacy. There was a, there's a small core of people like Dick, who who put those two sides of literacy together. That's an incalculable loss to the field. Just just for what he stood for, he didn't he wouldn't have to write another word. But just what he stood for as of mirroring that a, a, a humanities or humanistic approach to literacy w with the technological engineering approach that he was equally comfortable with, just no one's, you're not going to see the likes of that again because the field's too fragmented. Let's hope we do. Let's hope we do. Maybe one of my graduate students. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, Uh, again, I appreciate a lot what you're saying, where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, because that, you know, I, I just, I don't want you to fall over the cliff. Because, I don't, don't want to fall over the cliff either. It's, and it's, I am walking the tiger. It's 90% there, but but that's where you're sticking. And, and you and you got to, Anne is a good compass for you there. The Anne's, because, because she does more educational policy than I do. I'm not a policy person. Okay. And, and, and she'll know more than I will about about how some of these it's unfortunate but lots of education moves by buzzwords you control the language okay i mean that's how that's in part how whole language won for a while right every all the all the words i mean who whole and uh, emergent okay <laughs> you know who uh authentic you know who is you know, and then what's the other side got to do? Well, I'm for the inauthentic. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, no, it, 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 okay, the, the, um, uh, and, and you have to watch a similar thing, okay? Uh, how are the concepts that you're trying to get across going to translate into the buzzwords of education? Those are the worries that you're seeing. Anne is a perfect touchstone because she's in contact with policy more than I am. Good. Good. Yeah, I'll, I'll double back to her. Um, there is a relative to the buzzword side. One of the other projects. Um, let me take a few minutes and 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 help you uh, help us understand together with this this space so we can close it and go on to a couple of other things before we run out of time. How are you doing on time? Uh let's see. What's uh, yeah, we're getting on here. So, but let's let's cover these. How much time we got left on this? Twelve minutes on this tape. Okay. Um, the Children of the Code thing is for adults, teachers, parents that are willing to think about this. Mm -hmm. This is not going to reach beyond a certain level. I don't have any sense that it, that, that it will or expectation that it will. The children that need it the most and the parents of the children that need it the most are not likely to watch this. Right. Right. So uh, what we need for them is a way to do what you decide, get this one page, but get this one page embedded in something that they'll actually listen to and pay attention to. So <clears throat> we've begun the process of um, forming an alliance of individuals and organizations who really care about literacy and children and learning to read so that we can get together in a distributed forum 
so that we distribute a dialogue rather than having the expense and difficulty of trying to get together physically at the same time. Mm -hmm. And distill a top 15, top 20 things that we think are consensually the key things for children to get that will help either preframe or reframe to the extent wherever they are in the learn to read process. And then those things, once ratified by this group, are going to get fed to the uh, to an animated film company. And we already have Don Bluth. I don't know if you know the name, the company. They did Secret of the Nim and oh, Dogs okay. Go to Heaven and a bunch of other right. animated movies. They're like next to Disney. Okay. The guy came from Disney. And uh, so we need to bring the science community and the animated, you know, big theatrical release movie people together to make something that has an entertaining story that kids can kind of track the character challenges and... Um, and come upon a series of framing experiences about how to think about and experience this challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's one thing that we're interested in doing. Okay. Right? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds tremendous. Uh, there's another person I want to put you on to, sure. uh, to one of my um, ex-PhD students, uh, Ruth Nathan. Okay, she's down uh, in California, close close to Anne. Her, her and Anne still do things together. So, uh, and and she's a she's a master teacher with a PhD. <laughs> okay, and and uh, so um, she she works for Leapfrog now, and um, uh, it's someone who for to, uh, I'm thinking about the one pager. Um, she, um, you know, has, has done a ton of presentations to teachers uh, and, and uh, um, just is an extraordinary individual. And so good. someone you good. should... Uh, tried to talk to uh, uh, the president of Leapfrog a couple of times and didn't get anywhere. And was going to go somewhere with that too, I think, but never let him happen. Well, Ruth, well, Ruth would, is another inroad to Leapfrog because uh, she works there. So, um, but, um, uh, and, and Ruth just herself is a great presenter. Yeah, it sounds like, sounds like, and she love to meet her. just loves to do it. I mean, she's a performer and she's a, you know, a master teacher and you know, she's taught third grade. She, she well, part knows of the she, reason for this consensus is that by getting the National Center for Learning Disabilities, by getting the International Reading Association, by getting the National Center for Family Literacy to uh -huh. come in and ratify this thing, uh -huh. their distribution channels to get this film funded and ratcheted all the I way see. up and post production, so it's, they're all we're all kind of um, working towards a consensus that becomes implicit okay. in, for all of us. Okay, you, you have to worry about those consensus things, though. You can because <laughs> yeah, the it, consensus it, it, thing can wa can wash all the individuality out of it. Right? Yeah, I, I understand. I understand, and, and, and I, I'm not trying to make a consensus where there isn't one. Oh. But I'm trying to say we already have enough agreement that we could do a lot with it if we aligned behind it. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a lot we disagree about, there's a lot we can align behind. Yeah. No, I, I, I would be with you, but I, you know. Understood. Again, consensus things, you better, you, better, you know, you want to be careful, you know, that. Well, would you be in the loop on this? I would be in the loop. Yeah. Good. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, my sense is that relative to the teaching of reading, there's a point at which we have really taken the code for granted because it's been for exactly the reasons you were describing earlier, because it's, it's been such hell to open up Pandora's box about thinking about it as either in terms of repairing it, which goes the line of, of, uh, all of the alphabet reformers yeah. or all of the spelling reformers, which mm -hmm. turned out to be folly. Yeah. And, and there's such a distinct right. associated with that that nobody even wants to go near it. Yes, that's exactly right. Right? That's exactly right. Or the more right. recent version of it is, gosh, if you, once you start saying that the code's such a mess, then it leads to this wanting to naturally imbibe it rather than structure our way through it. And so for, for another, there's another reason why we don't want to talk about what a mess the code is. Right. Right? Right. Nonetheless, if we were to strip away all of those feelings and look at it as a code, uh -huh. as a technology, when we consider that it has... Yeah. Well, here, you just did one thing right there. Don't yeah. call it a mess. Okay. Okay. And again, this is probably Good. what 
you were getting into with Fineski at the I was chuckling at you too at the end there with okay. respect to variability and ambiguity. Okay. Well, it comes down to the perspective. So Colt, yeah. I mean, as an adult well, scientist, you can look at it. And no, say, oh, I understand your point about perspective. I'm talking okay. about something else here. Right, okay, yeah. Good. You kept telling him it's it's from your standpoint as the expert who's codified this thing on a bloody computer, it makes sense. But from, okay. But but now I'm talking about something else. I mean, you could call it complex. Um, call it uh, overlapping and layered. Okay. But, but. Fair enough. All okay. Right. Fair enough. The fixation, I, I you know, yeah, you know, the scribes did some crazy things. You're going to, you can't have people hearing that you're saying there's no patterns there. I'm not and, trying to say there's no patterns. point of fact, there. the connectionist networks are still going to learn it. They're just going to learn it slower. Okay. Just like Seymour's papers, the, the, the connectionist networks are going to learn it. They're going to learn it slower. They're even going to generalize. So if they're generalizing in, in a connectionist network, there's a pattern in there somewhere. Okay. That's the existence I proof that there's some the, pattern. There's patterns in there. I don't okay. have any question about the fact that there's okay. patterns. But that's what I said. So, so I wouldn't fixate on a, a, a really random thing that <laughs> that the scribes did, <laughs> okay? Or, or and don't call it a mess. That's just my advice. I mean, you okay, could, right. you obviously... I, no, no, no. <laughs> you know what? I appreciate the strength and energy and conviction yeah. that you're hitting me with to say don't call it a mess and to be more careful in how I language it. That, that's, I respect that. You know, there's, 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 certain lo there's certain pockets, yeah, you may consider that a mess. It, but it's, it's, that, again, yeah. I, what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is, is that it is a, uh, a unique and uh, unnatural and artificial form of confusion to the child. When, when you call it a technology, in, uh, that, uh, there's lots of the stuff in the transcripts that I saw that were good phrasings. Okay. Yeah. And my concern is, all right, how do we build a ramp through this confusion that's more learnable from the child's perspective based on the kinds of confusions they're experiencing as they move through it? Which, are, which, which can be quite different than the way we think about it as adults mapping the patterns in it from over here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the oh. main thing that I'm... And I'm saying that because of our aversion about talking about the code in, in certain ways, that we're, that we're not shining enough light on what we could do to unfold it and its challenges to children. Yeah, as I say, as I said, I am with you on the vast majority of this. Okay. I'm, I just, I don't want you to lose the ninety percent. Yeah. So as I just said it, that worked for you. That worked. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if we go back now to uh, Franklin, the, the, all the attempts to to teach reading seem to have uh, have this four way uh, pass. One was fix the code, which went to change the alphabet, change the spelling. The other one was teach it, which went the direction of phonics, which is a compensational system to try to get around the confusions that built up in this code, and whole language, which is an argument against phonics because of its tedious mechanical nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, so the the approach to trying to fix the code all died, 1906 roughly. Mm -hmm. That's a big right. historical thing associated with that. But up to this point, all, all of the attempts to fix it went down the path of we need a new alphabet or we need to spell with the one we got differently, which implied um, breaking tradition with the English written history of Right, this point. and the, all the problems that you go down all, that road. All the inertia, all of the, the difficulties associated with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a small coda on what you just said. I mean, when you describe phonics, I mean, a lot. I mean, many of the best phonics people would argue that they are doing that type of layering. That is, that they do layer on the later complexities of the orthography. Okay, and I'm thinking of people like Marsha Henry and, and uh, Bob Calfee. Okay, and and so what I mean is I, there is no phonics in a uh, in a in a transparent language, right? Phonics is something you do to try to reconcile the fact that the letters and sounds aren't working anymore. The, the letters and sounds don't um, correspond to each other. Well, you teach the code, and no matter what the transparency is. So, uh, what? what 
I, I don't want to argue about what we're calling phonics because okay. I, I, I'm not interested in that in a semantic dispute. But I'm, I'm just saying that some of the programs for are, are more, I, I wish we actually had a transcript because I'm saying the, uh, what, whatever you just said that phonics was, it was a rather constricted view. Okay. Okay. My understanding of is what phonics the... evolved in the 1650s as as reading teaching was very yeah. difficult as a way to try to reconcile I, letters and sounds. And, and I'm not talking about nor disputing any of that history. Okay. I'm I'm talking about how a, a, a modern up to date person who knows Scrag and Vineski and all the all the history who in fact worked some historical factors into their programs like uh, Marcia Henry like the the Ed Henderson people at Virginia Marcia Invernesi and Donnie Beers okay I, uh, the programs are more complex that's all I'm saying You're, the 